In the first century BC, Pontus and Bithynia were two kingdoms situated side by side along the moist climate of the Black Sea in the north of Asia Minor. It was here in these lands, in the age of the Roman Republic's rapid expansion from a regional power in Italy to the sole hegemon of the Mediterranean world, that a leader would arise to shake Rome's power to its core. This archenemy was the king of Pontus, whose name was Mithridates, a descendant of Persian and Greek royalty, and it was the fierce hardships of his boyhood that forged him. The son of a father whose life was cut violently short by an assassin's poison, Mithridates began his reign in the year 120, at the age of 15, together with his brother Crestus. As they weren't yet of age to rule in their own right, their mother Laodice served as their regent. But in yet more hardship for the teenage Mithridates, his mother favored Crestus for the throne to the point of plotting against her other son. And so Mithridates went into hiding, re-emerging years later as a grown man of strength and stature, ready to stand for himself and take what was his. He had his mother and brother imprisoned and took over as sole ruler of Pontus, showing himself a skilled organizer and inspiring leader for their people. In due course, both his mother Laodice and brother Crestus would meet an early end in prison. And the king of Pontus, Mithridates VI Eupator, would begin his new reign in earnest, a reign that would prove energetic, ambitious, and ruthless. Far to the west, in central Italy, the city of Rome had extended its reach, conquered or assimilated its foes, and achieved the status of a superpower, its influence spanning the three continents of Europe, Africa, and Asia. At the time of Mithridates' rule, Rome had long played the role of power broker in affairs among the Eastern kingdoms, an arbiter in disputes that had the might of wealth and legions to back it. Mithridates chafed at the rule of Rome over his territory, and aimed at enlarging his power by warring against the neighboring kingdom of Bithynia under the control of King Nicomedes and his dynasty. Nicomedes was well known for his Roman sympathies, an effective client to see to the interests of his Italian overlords in Asia Minor. Mithridates' invasions sparked upheaval in Bithynia, but Nicomedes' Roman friends didn't hesitate to rush to his aid. A first raid by Bithynia into Pontus's lands in the year 90 BC ended with a diplomatic settlement, and Mithridates, still claiming to be an ally of Rome, was able to turn the aggression against his kingdom into a rallying cry for opposition to the Romans and their puppet regime in Bithynia. This was hardly the end, neither of Mithridates' open war against Bithynia, nor his covert war against the Roman occupiers. In the next year of 89, Bithynia was again backed by Rome in an invasion of Pontus, forcing Mithridates to fight their combined strength and what would be known thereafter by Roman historians as the First Mithridatic War, the first of three by the end, after what would be more than twenty years of battles. The forces arrayed for war, and Mithridates and his generals faced off against Nicomedes and his Roman allies on the field. After chaos and carnage in their first battle, that saw chariots deployed, whose wheels were fitted with razor-sharp scythes to cut through soldiers across the field, Mithridates' armies emerged victorious, and Rome was left to recognize the real struggle that lay ahead. But back in Italy, 
Rome had been dealing with a crisis closer to home, as a civil war that pitted Rome against an alliance of cities within Italy had ravaged their own countryside. Bogged down in the social war, the mighty Republic couldn't commit enough troops for a full-scale suppression of events in Asia Minor. Mithridates' troops were soon spread throughout the region, liberating cities of Roman occupation, and the king set his own administrators over the new territories. Roman ambassadors and commanders were captured and paraded as trophies of war. The inhabitants of these cities welcomed Mithridates' men with shouts of joy, scornfully casting down Roman statues in disgust. In their eyes, they were being rescued from oppressors, and Mithridates was their savior, a figure as brilliant as the great kings of old, both Persian and Greek, the true heir of Cyrus the Great and the demigod Alexander. For the first time in a long time, the people of Asia Minor felt they had hope for a better future and a land that was theirs. Mithridates didn't back down from his crusade, the adulation of the people driving him onward. But he was a shrewd tactician and realized that only in a bond of blood could the peoples of Asia be truly unified. And so, a truly horrific idea was born, one that would make the name of Mithridates an object of fear across the Mediterranean world. Perhaps it was his deep hatred of the Romans that impelled this act. Perhaps it was the applause of the nations cheering for a savior that led him to secure that glory at any price. Some say a philosopher, famous for his rage against Rome, planted the idea in the king's mind. However it was born, the act of terror Mithridates conceived would indeed come to pass. The genocide of all Romans and Italians who lived in the cities of Asia Minor in one swift stroke of murder. While preparing ships for an attack on the island of Rhodes, the king secretly wrote a letter to the magistrates and governors of all his newly conquered Asian communities, passing on these orders to kill anyone of Italian origin. The massacres were to take place on the same day and would emphasize those major cities with especially large Roman populations. No one was to be off limits. Not a single man, woman, child, elderly, or infirm person of Roman or Italian heritage was to be spared. And afterwards, the spoils looted from their homes were to be shared among them all, including with Mithridates himself. He wanted nothing less than obliteration, shedding the blood of the occupier. Not only this, but no proper burial of the bodies was to be allowed. Instead, the victims would be thrown to the dogs and abandoned. Swift penalties would befall anyone caught burying the dead or sheltering the Romans from harm, but rewards would be given to those who killed those in hiding or informed authorities of where they could be found. In exchange for betraying their masters, Mithridates would grant slaves their freedom, and he would honor debtors who killed their lenders with a release from their obligations. After years of Roman tyranny, Mithridates was counting on the people of Asia Minor, being all too willing and eager to enact revenge on those who would colonize their land. And for that, he was not disappointed. On the chosen day, in May of 88 BC, a nightmare of ruthless bloodshed began in over a dozen cities across the eastern Mediterranean and would ensue for days to follow. It was an event to go down among the most egregious mass murders in history, an event known today 
as the Asiatic Vespers. Those who enacted Mithridates' bloody bidding were citizens of all stripes, wealthy and poor, Greek and Asian, slave and free, all mobilized by the charismatic power of their savior king and their dream of a nation freed from a domineering Rome. Their victims, just the same, were ordinary folk whose only distinguishing marks, the signs that condemned them to death, were their land of birth and the tongue they spoke. They had sought to live, work, and raise their families in Asia Minor, shopkeepers, entrepreneurs, lenders, merchants, tax collectors, the neighbors of the very ones who would slaughter them. Scenes tragic and violent haunt the pages of the ancient historians who recorded the dark days of the Asiatic Vespers. Hunted for death, Romans in the city of Ephesus ran to the temple of Artemis for safety, clinging to the goddess's sacred statues and begging for their lives. But to no avail, as their fellow Ephesians dragged them out into the streets to slay them. In the face of ancient tradition, that made temples into sacred sites of refuge. Of this temple in Ephesus, one of the grandest shrines in all the world, Alexander the Great, and even Mithridates himself in earlier times, had affirmed it as a place of holy sanctuary guaranteed to any in need. But in the eyes of the killers, no divine power would stoop to protect enemies as depraved as the occupying Romans. Their faith and their bloody crusade permitted no mercy, no second thoughts. Scenes similar to this played out all through Asia Minor. To the south, in the city of Kaunos, children were killed in front of their parents, wives in front of their husbands, until the men themselves were put to death last of all. To the north, in Adramition, Romans fled to the sea in the dark of night, hoping to swim to safety, but instead were followed into the water and drowned. The inhabitants of Trales took a different, yet equally savage, approach. Not wishing to dirty their own hands, they banded together and voted to hire a trained killer who would act on their orders. The executioner, named Theophilus of Paphlagonia, had the captured Romans brought into the local temple of the Roman goddess Concordia, where he and his men personally carried out their labor with cold efficiency. Mithridates chose the new capital city of Pergamon as his headquarters, taking over its royal palace for his own ends, and there the Italian residents hid themselves in the temple of the healing god Asclepius. When angry mobs tried to tear them away from their sanctuary, they fought back, until violence escalated to the point of Mithridates' loyalists firing arrows into the temple, killing all those who sheltered inside. Even on the island of Chios, ancient documents record Mithridates' complaint that the citizens of Chios had failed to hand over their share of the seized property of Romans, likely those who had been killed in their own purge of the island. But among these echoes of terror, another tale told offers a story of survival, where on the island of Kos, Roman families huddled inside its temple were spared, as the citizens refused to act, less out of compassion for the Romans than fear of the gods who safeguarded the right of sanctuary. When reports of this widespread carnage across the eastern Mediterranean grew in number, an answer from Rome was inevitable. The rebellion of Mithridates could no longer be ignored. And the man selected to spearhead this war of suppression was every bit an equal to the ambitious, cunning, and pitiless character of Mithridates himself. Lucius Cornelius Sulla, would head the expedition, having recently been elected to the office of consul, the highest office in the Republic. His string of harsh victories in Rome's civil war against its Italian allies, and his recent marriage into one of Rome's most powerful families, 
had made him an appealing candidate, behind whom the Roman Senate threw its support. Five legions were assembled under Sulla's command, and the path eastward, through Greece and into Asia Minor, to challenge this rebel king of Pontus, lay ahead. While Mithridates's plot had inflicted immeasurable losses on the Roman and Italian populations in the east, it hadn't reached his goal of total annihilation. Many had fled to the island of Rhodes, an ally of Rome, and found safety there. Mithridates had already taken over the city of Athens, installing a dictator named Aristion there to see to his wishes. But his attempt to win control of Rhodes had failed. When Sulla's army arrived to cut a swath across the land of Greece, the stronghold of Athens saw vicious fighting and a long destructive siege at Roman hands, a battle well known from accounts and Roman historians and veterans of the expedition, including the now lost memoirs of Sulla himself. But at the high price of Rome's brutal success, the Republic won back its Greek allies from Mithridates, and as Sulla's legions pressed on into the rebel king's domains, the first Mithridatic war would see many more battles and casualties in the years that followed. And Mithridates himself, suffering eventual defeat in this war, would regroup and set his energies again on his war of liberation and revenge, fighting on tooth and nail for twenty more years. The massacre of 88 BC sent shockwaves throughout the world and saw the slaughter of some 80,000 people, though some sources place the count as high as 150,000. Hundreds of years later, those days of terror were still well remembered by many. One of these was Aurelius Augustinus from North Africa, better known to history as St. Augustine of Hippo. His words, recounted in his magnum opus, City of God, capture the dread and sheer astonishment the Asiatic Vespers still roused centuries on. How horrifying a spectacle unfolded when each man was suddenly and wickedly murdered wherever he happened to be, in the field or on the road, in the town, in his own home or in the street, in market or temple, in bed or at table. Think of the groans of the dying, the tears of the onlookers, and even of the killers themselves. How cruel a necessity was it that compelled the hosts of these victims not only to see these evil butcheries in their own houses, but even to perpetrate them. For ordinary people to transform their face in a moment from that of a gentle friend to a ruthless murderer. 